Assalamu alaikum. Uh, dear students, uh, I hope you're doing well. I hope you are safe, staying at home, filling your time with something useful and studying molecular biology, our beautiful subject. So here we go. Let's uh, talk about transcription, uh, continue with transcription and uh, talk specifically about regulation of transcription. Or in other words, um, controlling gene activity or in other words how genes are expressed now note the um, the term that I used um, so gene expression okay now uh, if I say gene expression that is so it means that we're talking about if genes are active or not that is at the transcriptional level are they transcribed or not? So if they are transcribed, it means that genes are expressed, genes are active. If they are not transcribed, it means that genes are not active or not expressed. So um, again, uh, resources, this lecture, as well as chapter eight of uh, Cooper's textbook. Of course, uh, there are more details in the textbook than what I'll mention here. There are a few things that I might mention that do not exist in the book. So, um, so let's talk about regulation of transcription in prokaryotes. And, and again, the reason why we start with prokaryotic systems is because they are easy. Okay, the easy to understand. Specifically, we'll talk about the lac operon. Lac stands for lactose. So, the thing is, uh, understanding gene expression sort of started in the 1950s by experiments done by French scientists um, uh, Jacob and Monod, and uh, they did these beautiful experiments showing how bacteria can control metabolism of lactose. So lactose is a sugar. It is a disaccharide. It means that it is made of um, two sugars. And the sugars are glucose, this one here, connected to galactose. Okay, so you have two sugars, glucose and galactose. Now what happens is uh, lactose is metabolized. It is first cleaved by an enzyme known as beta-galactosidase. So what this enzyme does is that it hydrolyzes lactose using water, hydro. It lyses, that is, it cleaves um, lactose right here, producing two sugar monomers, monosaccharides, again, galactose and glucose. Now, something else about beta-galactose, uh, galactosidase, I'm sorry, is that um, it can change the conformation, that is, the structure of lactose into something known as allolactose. So instead of having the connection, the bond between the two sugars at this point, between this carbon and that carbon, the connection is now different it's between this carbon with that carbon. Okay, so this is uh, what we call an isomer, and it's called as an allolactose. Anyhow, so, but this is a minor form, okay? So the majority of lactose would be hydrolyzed, that is cleaved, into two monosaccharides, galactose and glucose. And these are uh, Jacob and Mono. They got the Nobel Prize for their work. So, the lac operon. Remember when we defined an apron and we said an apron is basically a genetic unit, a cistron, that is transcribed into one single messenger RNA, which is right here shown in red, but um, it is translated producing different proteins. Each one of them has its own function, that's one. Number two, they participate in the same process. So these three proteins are involved in the metabolism of 
lactose. The proteins that are produced from the lac operon are beta-galactosidase, lactose permease, and transacetylase. Beta-galactosidase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. Lactose permease is a protein that helps in transporting lactose into cells. Transacetylase acetylates beta-galactosides. Beta-galactosides are sugars just like lactose. When we say acetylates, it means that what it does is that it adds an acetyl group to uh, molecules like beta-galactosides. Now, we know very well what the functions of permease and galactosidase is, but we don't know much about the function of the transacetylase. So anyhow, we will focus on uh, these two, particularly the galactosidase enzyme. Okay, so, so this lac operon has its own promoter region. This is the RNA polymerase binding site. And you have transcription of this operon into a single unit of messenger RNA. And each part of the messenger RNA would produce a different protein with a different function. Now, there is another gene that is located away, far away from the lac operon on the same chromosome, of course, because remember, bacteria have one single chromosome as their genome. So there is a gene that is known as the lac I. I stands for inhibitor. Okay, so what this, what the product of this gene does is that it regulates how the lac operon is expressed. That is, if it is expressed or not. Now, remember something that bacteria do have operons, like this one here, the lac operon, but at the same time, they do have genes that produce one single protein or one single polypeptide, at least. Okay, so they do have monocystronic genes and they also have polycystronic genes as well. Okay, so again, this is what an operon is. That's the definition. You can read it. A cluster of genes transcribed from one promoter. Right here, that's the promoter. This is the RNA polymerase. So you have start of transcription producing one messenger RNA, and this messenger RNA is polycystronic, meaning that it produces different proteins with different functions. Okay, now these proteins are different, but they participate in the same pathway or the same mechanism. In this case, it's the metabolism of lactose. Okay. Now, there is something else um, that is part of the uh, lac operon. And that is, there is a region known as the operator. Okay, so this is a regulatory region. So it is an element, okay, that exists between the promoter and the transcription start site. Okay, so this is a regulatory region right here. This region, that is the operator, is the binding site of the protein product of the LAC-I gene. So the LAC-I gene produces a protein, and this protein is known as the LAC repressor, the LAC repressor. So this protein right here is produced from the LAC-I gene, okay, and it binds right here at the promoter preventing the RNA polymerase from starting transcription. So it blocks transcription, okay? So if the lac repressor is bound to the operator, the RNA polymerase cannot start transcription. So it is an inhibitor of the lac operon. Okay, so in order for the RNA polymerase to start transcription of the lac operon, the repressor must be released. And it is released when 
the molecule allolactose binds to it. So when there is allo, when there so when there is lactose, let's go back. So when there is lactose, okay, what happens is some of it is converted to allolactose, and this allolactose would bind to the repressor, releasing it from the operator. So now the RNA polymerase can start transcription. And it makes sense, right? I mean, you don't want transcription of the lac operon to start unless there is lactose. Otherwise, it would be a waste of time and resources. Okay. So here's the thing again. So whenever lactose is present, the repressor is inactive. So the lac I would make the repressor the repressor, right, that's the mRNA of the lac I gene producing the repressor protein. If there is allolactose, if there's lactose, some of it would be converted to allolactose. Allolactose would bind to the repressor, preventing its binding to the operator so the RNA polymerase can start transcription, producing the polycystronic messenger RNA, producing the three different proteins. And metabolism would of metabolism would and metabolism of uh, lactose would start whereby galactosidase would cleave lactose into these two monosaccharides and these two monosaccharides can then be metabolized. Now this is known as positive regulation of transcription. Why? Because the presence of lactose positively regulates transcription, meaning that it activates transcription of the gene. Good. Now, few terms um, that you need to know. We have something in molecular biology when it comes to gene expression and transcription is that you have what is known as cis-acting elements. Remember, whenever I say elements, we are talking about DNA or RNA sequences, like the iron response element binding protein. Okay, so it is an element that exists in RNA and it controls, it regulates uh, transcription somehow. Cis means uh, same level. Okay, so a cis acting element is basically a, um, a region that it that exists in DNA, for example, and this region controls the expression of this particular gene. Now, if we take this region and we move it, uh, we change its location, okay? Uh, so if we put, for example, the operator, if we put the operator somewhere else, it would not be active right it would not be able to regulate transcription because in this case the operator would bind to it but it doesn't block the rna polymerase now please mention other examples of cis acting elements from the previous lecture on transcription i'll give you a hint enhancers for example these are cis cis acting elements except that there is a twist, there is something with enhancers. That is, if you take these enhancers and you change their location, they can still be functional. But if you put them really far away from where the gene is, okay, they wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't be functional anymore. If you take them and you put them on a different chromosome, they would not be functional anymore, right? So think about other cis acting elements. Now that's the first term, cis acting elements. Now the other term is trans acting factors. Trans means a different level. So when we say factors, we are really talking about products of transcription. So we're talking about RNA molecules, we're talking about protein molecules. So this that's the meaning of factors. Okay, we're not talking about sequences. We are rather talking about uh, products of uh, genes like, again, RNA or proteins. So why are they called trans? 
different level because if you take a gene that produces a, um, a certain protein and you put it on a different region of the chromosome that is far away from where the gene of the, from the gene that is regulated is or if you put it on a different chromosome it can still be functional why because it will produce a protein and this protein can bind on a sequence of another chromosome okay so it's like floating it it swims in the nucleus and it can bind anywhere on dna so it's known as transacting elements now an example of a transacting element is the repressor itself okay that is if you take the lac i gene and you put it somewhere else far away from the lac operon well it can still be transcribed if it has its own promoter of course it can still be transcribed and it can still produce a protein a repressor and this protein would bind to the operator okay so try to think of other types of um, transacting elements okay good so why did jacob and Monod got the nobel prize because the, what they did is that they created a number of mutations so they did induce mutations themselves and in different regions and they tried to understand what these mutations would do and based on these mutations they were able to understand the lack operon and how it is regulated now some of the mutations that they did and some of the mutations that take place in our genome can result in constitutive expression what we mean by that is basically a mutation that results in the gene being always on okay so basically it results in constitutive expression the the gene is always on and it's not regulated anymore so it doesn't get turned turned off now think about examples of uh, mutations that can take place in the lac operon that would result in constitutive expression Here's an example. So if you have mutation in the operator itself, which is right here. So if there is a mutation in the operator that prevents the lac I from binding to the operator. So there is change of the DNA sequence of the operator so that the lac I uh, product, that is the repressor, cannot bind to the operator. This means that the RNA polymerase can bind freely to the promoter and it can transcribe the lac operon all the time. So think of other mutations that can result in constitutive expression. Now you have other mutations that can cause non-inducible or repressed expression, meaning that the gene is always off. In other words, whether there is lactose or not, the gene is always off okay it cannot be induced okay so here's an example okay and think of other examples as well if you have mutation in the lac i gene so that the lactose or the allolactose cannot bind to it anymore and this so this mutation would mean that the lac repressor would always be bound the operator okay so that would make the gene uninduced or non-induced or repressed so even if there is lactose in the in inside the cells well it cannot bind to the repressor and the repressor would still be bound preventing the RNA polymerase from transcribing the gene now, you can apply these um, uh, concepts to other genes, whether in bacteria or in our cells. Okay. Now, there is another level of regulation, and this regulation is mediated by the molecule cyclic AMP. 
So cyclic AMP basically is a small molecule that is produced from ATP. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It can be converted to what is known as cyclic AMP. So it has one phosphate and um, it, it has a structure that looks more cyclic. So it's called cyclic AMP. Now this cyclic AMP binds to another protein known as CAP or catabolite activating protein. What this protein does is that it binds, notice the, 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 the word that I'm using, it binds to a DNA region that is upstream of the promoter. So when it binds to this region right here, it interacts with the RNA polymerase and it activates it. And this cap protein binds to this region, binds to DNA when there is cyclic AMP. So if there's cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP binds to cap, cap becomes active, it binds upstream of the promoter, it interacts with the RNA polymerase, and it stimulates, that is, it induces, that is, it activates the RNA polymerase, so the RNA polymerase now is more efficient, it's more active, so it keeps on transcribing the lac operon very efficiently and quickly, producing a lot of messenger RNA from the lac operon, producing a lot of beta galactosidase and a lot of permease and transacetylase. Okay? Now, so how is cyclic AMP produced? Why is it produced? In what circumstances? So that's again the idea, cap. So if you have cap and cap is not bound upstream of the promoter region, RNA polymerase, and if there is no repressor, RNA polymerase can start transcription, okay? But if there is cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP would bind to CAP. CAP can then bind to DNA, inducing the RNA polymerase, producing a lot of uh, polycystronic uh, mRNA from the operon, lac operon. So you have a lot of transcription going on. So the question is, when do cells produce cyclic AMP? And why? Well, it's all regulated by glucose, and glucose induces what is known as negative regulation. That's the opposite of lactose, meaning that if there is glucose, it means that lac operon should not be active, and it makes sense. I mean, if you think about it, if bacteria have both lactose and glucose, what do you think bacteria would prefer to metabolize? Well, glucose. Why? Because first you have to hydrolyze lactose into two monosaccharides and these are glucose and galactose. Well, if there is glucose already in the, in, 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 in the cells, why do cells have to bother and produce beta-galactosidase? Or there is no need to produce beta-galactosidase a lot. And it makes sense. Now, the thing is, um, how, how is that happening? How does glucose regulate transcription? Well, what it does is that it inhibits, it binds to, and it inhibits a protein, an enzyme known as adenylcyclase. What adenylcyclase does is that it is the enzyme that converts ATP to cyclic AMP. So this is the structure of cyclic AMP, okay? Now, if there is glucose, glucose would inhibit adenylyl cyclase, meaning that there is no more conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP, meaning that CAP would not be able to bind upstream of the promoter region and it would not be able to activate the RNA polymerase, okay? Meaning that you may have some transcription, but it's not very efficient compared with if CAP is bound to cyclic AMP and bound to the DNA region. Okay? So now, so that's the idea. So what happens again is that if there is high glucose, glucose 
would not, um, glucose would bind to adenylcyclase. Adenylcyclase is active, producing, uh, 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 resulting in, 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 the, um, in having bacteria low level of cyclic AMP. CAP cannot bind to DNA, and there is very little transcription. But if there is no glucose, adenylcyclase is very active, producing a lot of cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP binds to CAP. CAP can then bind to the DNA upstream of the RNA polymerase binding site, that is the promoter, and you have a lot of transcription. Okay? So here you have the following situations. If there is no lactose and there is glucose, it means that there is low cyclic AMP. It means that the repressor is bound to the operator and there is no transcription, right? And of course, cap is not bound, okay? But it doesn't matter because if, if there is no lactose, the repressor would always be bound. Now, if there's lactose and glucose, there is preference for, produce, for metabolizing glucose and you can have some transcription of the lac operon to metabolize lactose, but not a whole lot. So there is lactose. Lactose binds to the repressor. The repressor is released from the operator. The RNA polymerase can transcribe, it can move forward and it can transcribe, but it's not very efficient. Why? Because cap is not bound. Why is it that cap is not bound? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Why is it that cap is not bound? Because there is glucose, there is little cyclic AMP, so cap is not able to bind upstream of the promoter activating the RNA polymerase. Now, if there is lactose and there is no glucose, it means that adenylcyclase is very active, producing a lot of cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP binds to cap, right? So it makes sense now that the RNA polymerase is very active and because there is no, and because there is lactose, the repressor is not bound to the operator and you have production of a lot of messenger RNA. Now, if you understand this concept of regulation, that would be great because we can apply it to, we can apply it to uh, uh, human genes as well. Okay, so the thing is, so that's the take home message that, okay, that is gene expression is regulated by regulatory proteins, transcriptional factors, for example, like, um, like uh, uh, CAP, like um, uh, the repressor, for example. And what these do, they can guide the RNA polymerase or other, other regulatory proteins to the promoter they can strengthen or stabilize the binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter. They can activate the RNA polymerase. They can open up the DNA for the DNA polymerase, facilitating uh, transcription. Now, the opposite can happen in case of repressors. That is, repressors, for example, they can prevent the binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter. They can inactivate RNA polymerases. They can keep the DNA shut, okay, um, preventing the formation of the open promoter complex. So they keep it in, in the form of a closed promoter complex. So it's not open anymore. Okay, so that's how regulatory transcriptional regulatory proteins work. Now, and this can be applied to eukaryotic systems as well. Now, the thing is, uh, just to um, explain this a bit further, now all of the above effects are mediated via non-covalent interactions between, the, between DNA and these regulatory proteins. So it's all non-covalent interactions. Okay, so here's an example just to make things more clear. Here you have a DNA, and this just to show you how proteins would recognize DNA sequences specifically. That is, in other words, why is it that the cap protein uh, cannot bind somewhere else on DNA, uh, none specifically? Why is it that the repressor would bind to the operator specifically? Well, the thing is, 
the operator or the cap binding site, they have certain DNA sequences, okay? Certain order of, uh, of, of nitrogenous bases of nucleotides, like for example here, C, T, uh, G, T. So it's a certain sequence. And this is a regulatory protein right here, and it does interact with, specifically with uh, these bases. Now, the interaction occurs between a specific sequence or order of amino acids of the protein with non-covalently with the bases in that specific order, okay? So you have this protein having the same structure twice, so it's sort of like duplicated, and it's the same sequence right here, C, T, G, T. So you have the same, same structure of protein right here, okay? Same order of amino acids within the pro uh, protein interacting on, on both sides, and these interact with these uh, with the sequence of uh, amino acids, uh, of uh, bases or nucleotides or sequence of DNA. Okay, so it's all non-covalent interaction. So that's how proteins uh, recognize specific sequences and bind to these sequences. Now notice something here. Remember when we talked about the uh, major groove and the minor groove? Well, here you have the major groove and here you have the minor groove. Now remember that proteins preferably like to interact with bases of DNA in the major groove because, because they can insert themselves within the major groove and they can be, become close to, to the bases of DNA um, in the major groove. Okay, so this is how, remember, this is how proteins interact with DNA specifically. Now, if you understand this concept, that would be great because we can then apply this to eukaryotic systems, except that eukaryotic systems are more complex. So we'll stop here and continue in the next lecture. Allah ma'akum.